So it's a fairy lamp and it glows under a black light. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey everybody, it's George the Antique Nomad. I am back at the West Palm Beach Antique Show. This is the February Extravaganza. And what that means is that there is a second building completely full of stuff and a bunch of dealers who came down just for this show or only do this show the one time a year because this is the biggest one on the season. We will have some new things to see and we're just going to focus on the highlights of stuff that we haven't shown you before. So come along and let's take a look at what came down for this show. I want to start with some highlights of some of the fresh things that I have in my space and one of the things I'm the most excited about especially now that it's clean, is this really wonderful chalkware mirror. There, there. Here we are. And this was hanging in Webb's Department and Drug Store in St. Petersburg, Florida from about 1935 until that store closed in the late 70s. It is really neat. This was in the women's lounge, so it was the first thing you saw when you came in. It's all chalkware surround. It has a little shelf here where you can put a nice figurine. I might just do that at some point. It's in really wonderful shape. I'm pricing it around 200. I don't know that there are any more like it in existence. I'm sure they only made a handful for stores in the first place. I did bring back the Putti Italian silk throw that I bought here last time because I really couldn't display it well last time. I have this. I haven't had this out at a show in a long time because it's very heavy, but it's double-sided. This one shows the Blatt's beer tray for the non-alcohol beer from 1926, and this is actually a printing stone. This is made out of sandstone. It is extremely heavy, but if you look, it is indeed a wedge of sandstone. They could get a really pure inking on it apparently and there's the other side this lovely pinup girl for 4x pilsner beer behind the mccoy frog there which i just love that recumbent frog i have this which appears to be a genuine dollar bill but i've got to look at it more closely to make sure if it is it dates to 1862. the reason i think it's genuine is someone went to great length to frame it so that you can see both sides. So I'm going to do a little more looking. I might have to take it out of the glass to say for absolute certain. It's circulated. It's been in someone's hands because it has some fold lines. This old assay scale for weighing metals is a neat one. It's a little larger than the one I had at the last show that I did. This is a Henry Tromner, a big scale maker out of Philadelphia. Done for the Arthur H. Thomas Company, as you see on the celluloid tag there. I imagine Ar Arthur H. Thomas likely was a supplier of scientific equipment to labs because that's where something like this would have been used. And you've seen a lot of the Western before, but the bench it's sitting on is Chinese. It is period. This would have been something used by a barber to have the customer sit while they did their tonsorial duties. You can see the carving here and the age this has pegging in the top. It's going to date to the 19th century and it's worth about 300. This is another cool thing that's fresh to me and that is the Tom Hamilton's football game called Pigskin. Tom Hamilton, as it says there, was the coach of the U.S. Navy Academy during the Second World War primarily. He was on a very storied team of theirs. They were not a great team when he was coaching them, but they were a great team when he was playing for them. We'll open up the lid here and you can see that it's got all of its stuff. And then you open this and this is your chartograph. So you line up all of your players and then this apparently is showing the Army-Navy game and the different plays that they charted. And this is from the Army-Navy Classic at Soldier Field, Chicago in 1926. 
And then here is the chartograph to do your own game. Apparently there's a whole pad of these. So it looks like somebody started once to play this and didn't play it again. But it is cool. It's got the cards, it's got the little pegs. I just think it's really neat. I also think it's worth about $35. I bought this at Mount Dora. I think it's just amazing. This is similar to Chalet of Canada, so it's based on Murano glass, but let me pick it up so you can see better that it actually has swirls and pulls at the bottom. This is a company called Lorraine Glass, also out of Canada. They were competitors to Chalet in Canada. Look how beautiful that is. It just looks like flames leaping everywhere. I, I just love that color and that shape. A fireman and his wife who were here earlier today, a young couple, and they are thinking of buying it because they collect fire related things and they're thinking this might make a nice centerpiece because it looks like flames. This carved owl I thought was cute. I don't think it's Widco, even though I did get it in Seattle and Widco came from Mount Vernon, Washington, but it does have a nice mark on the back. So I might have to do a little more investigating on that piece. And then I got a bunch of new things from a consigner, new to me anyway. These red vases, they just have really fun shapes because they're kind of amorphous you can sort of see through but it's primarily opaque but they're a little bit transparent if you have a strong light behind them they also had a number of these animals these are wedgwood they had crystal made for them and this little guy here i think is especially cute because i like seahorses the candlestick holders are waterford as is the ice bucket Waterford is one of the few clear glass lines that I can sell. People like Waterford. It's relatively inexpensive for the quality and the combination of the two is a winner for most people. And I've got this cordial set with the different colors. That's 1980s. These menu blanks are from Pan Am Airways. I just came into these. And on the inside, they show the color, cover design is by Lillian Sater, one of America's leading young artists who combines a deft color touch with a sensitive flair for intricate designs. And she did a whole bunch of different monuments from places that Pan Am flew and they made them into menus. This one was never printed upon, which is nice. And it's sitting in a Weller Atlas star-shaped bowl from the 1930s that I think is cool. So a few new things there. And then there's these. I think these are quite stunning. These are Costa Boda and Chell, K-J-E-L-L, -L, is one of their two designers that were very popular along with Valien at this time. And he did these, they're called Catwalk, this series, partly because they're sinuous, partly because they have vaguely almost watercolor impressions of people in high fashion. This set here is by Hager. Hager's becoming very popular and this is a 1960s line with the gold. They use 22 karat gold, they called it gold tweed. Uh, the gold is suspended in the paint so it's not really anything other than a trace amount so it doesn't really have value for being gold but it does have a nice Royal Hager mark and it has value for being Royal Hager. And I've got the console, a couple of leaf dishes, and the bowl. So that's a nice set there. This piece I also just got, this is Fenton Custard Glass. This is hand painted. C.S. Johnson is the artist on this. Certain artists are starting to sell for more. There's starting to be more scholarship. And there's the Fenton paper label that was used up until 1974, and it glows under a black light. So it's a fairy lamp and it glows under a black light, which means it's really the perfect thing to put on YouTube for one of the viewers. So if any of you folks are interested, drop me a line. If I still have it, it'll be yours. And one more new thing that I want to point out, a new old thing, is this. This is cameo carved on the actual shell. And so you are seeing her 
on the cowrie shell. This is the same type of shell that they make cameo jewelry from, but this is one where they've actually done the entire piece, and I think she's just very pretty. And I find that these shells do very well in Florida. And I'm hopeful that she'll sell in the $30 to $40 range. The last one I had did. I bought a little bit of fresh costume jewelry. The cluster earrings to the left are marked Robert, which is actually said as Robert. And the clusters are very popular right now. People really like these little tiny rhinestones and things done together as flowers, particularly. Patty Carnegie, Marian Pascal, Stanley Hagler, a bunch of other companies did these and they're very hot right now. And then this one with the inverted watermelon stone is a Whiting and Davis piece. And yes, they did do jewelry, not just the mesh purses. So that was a cool thing to find as well. Great color, and I have a lot of customers for this type of jewelry. Yes, comrade, that is Lenin that you see in this little statue here. I got a couple of things. This is made of some sort of lead. It's very heavy. Lead because that was a cheap metal in good supply that they could make little Lenin busts out of. Of course, a lot of folks in the Eastern Bloc gave up on Lenin and Leninism, and thus a lot of these ended up getting thrown away, so they're pretty collectible here in the West now. And also from that same estate was this guy. These were various commemorative propaganda pieces. You can see the crackling. It wasn't made to be high quality. It was made to be ephemeral. But some folks kept them, and now they've come into the United States market, and they sell for about $30 a piece here. We're going to start looking at things we haven't seen before at this show, and here's a really beautiful one. This is Wavecrest, and this is a perfume atomizer. It's not the usual thing we see from them. They were in business till just before World War I, and this would have been late production for them because they didn't really do much of this. They mainly did dresser boxes, but obviously an atomizer would have been a nice go-along, and when atomizers became very popular around 1910, this would have been one of the designs that you saw. Beautiful piece, priced at 375. Wavecrest is on the spendy side, but it's great quality. This is a really cool piece that my friend got. This is Messer's Charcoal Gum. And there is the other tag. This is Mission. It's Arts and Crafts. It's a very hard to find product and it is priced at $500. So don't overlook little cases because if the product that came in them was scarce, they're scarce and they can be valuable. These are 20th century, but look at these amazing pieces of cloisonne. I mean, just look at the detail in these elephants. And they've got the brass ears. They have urns on top, because I guess they were meant to be around a door opening or an entryway, or maybe out in a garden if you live in a place that can handle it. It's just amazing to me. They've got these huge chargers that are Chinese with the yellow. Yellow was the imperial color, and up until the end of the dynasties, no one was allowed to have yellow other than the imperial family. And so yellow is still considered a very desirable color, even though these are 20th century. My friend just got this. This is Peel's beer, which started in 1883. This is a nice porcelain sign. It does not have a lot of scratches, scrapes, or rust. And the colors indicate probably just after Prohibition. Well, I am going to sit very quietly amongst my lion friends here. These are big, I think they're bronze, hollow bronze, statuary from somebody's manse. <laughs> they're pretty cool. They're about life size and a little frightening, which I like. Anyhow, I wanted to take a moment while I have my break with the lions and say thank you for watching this video. Please thumbs up to like this video and click the uh, bell to be notified of future videos. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything, but it does help us with YouTube and they like it when we have subscribers. It also would be great if you're interested in membership benefits to take a look at that join button. And if you click that, you'll see a little video and it'll tell you some of the options you have for memberships. And with that, we'll get back to this video. Well, I'm across from the dealers with the lovely silver again. 
and they have a line of muffineers that I want to show you. A muffineer was used for powdered sugar. Powdered sugar was a big deal confection to sprinkle on everything around the turn of the last century. And you can tell muffineers because they have a lot of holes in the top and it's a single shaker rather than a pair. They tended to be very ornate because, well, there's nothing more fun than pouring sugar on things, so you need to do it in a fancy manner, right? These are beautiful sterling pieces from that era, all going to date around 1900. And you're going to see uh, these things with English hallmarks, as you see here, the lettering there. This one is William Adams, 1926, and that one is priced at 345. I'm going to not touch them because I don't have my gloves and I don't want to soil them or stain them. And then here's the tea caddy. So they're just beautiful. Look at the design all the way around. And they price anywhere from $90 for silver plate on up to $365. This dealer has something very special I wanted to show you. This piece with the inlay was sold at Christie's about 10 years ago in New York and sold for about $3,200 at that time. And you can see why it's got the Ormolu brass mountings. The inlays are really spectacular and detailed and the condition is good. All of that different fruit wood carved and laid by hand so that you get those designs in all the different colors. And that is what they would refer to as marquetry. If you think of parquetry like a parquetry floor, that's geometric. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, and the gentleman's going to lift the top so that we can see it's got a great mirror inside and the drawer slides out. So a very functional piece for a small space and it appears to be it appears to be rosewood in the base. Yeah. And that's unusual. You usually don't see that as a uh, base wood on the inside under the drawer. So that is really something special and that's why the value is so high is because of, well, what it is and how it was made. And I'll show you this because that shows a French Ormolu mounted walnut rosewood and marquetry desking table and there it is. Now this is the extravaganza and that is why you see all the way down there it is full, all the way down the breezeway all sorts of dealers in here. There's dealers in the back parking area and that building behind is completely full. So we're gonna take a look around and see what we can show you. And the first thing I wanna show is this really fun mosaic tile table. Very abstract. We see these from the 60s. A lot of these were done as kits or freehand by someone who just bought a table and decided to decorate it. Sometimes they have fanciful modern designs like this. Sometimes they're actually an object. I see a lot of Native American motifs with them and they're popular. They usually sell for a few hundred dollars. I don't see the price on that particular one. I see compacts, but they look newer. And then we've got some costume jewelry here. I am looking for more costume. Let's see what this domed pin looks like. Fall colors. It projects outward. Kind of thought this might be signed, but I don't see a signature on it. Looks a little too much like a hubcap for my taste. Speaking of compacts, Wedgwood made compacts as well as jewelry and the Jasper wear. And there's a nice one there. It's only priced at $12. It's got the Stratton English name because they were the main compact maker and they used the Wedgwood as the insert. I did find some things in this space to buy. I'm going to buy the little Danish candlesticks here because I think they're cute. I don't recognize the mark. I don't think it matters. I'm getting the little bear claw pin that also converts to a pendant for 15 and 10 for that and then oh, that sorry. that's okay this is the micro mosaic and 10 for that so very nice to have some nice things for the jewelry case well this person has a camera collection to rival the camera collection i have been selling and their prices are not bad 85 on the argo flex twin lens is a pretty decent deal really this one's an agfa a lot of these are German, Agfa Ansko, and a lot of these 
larger ones in the bigger formats are priced as high as a hundred and a quarter, 135. Some unusual things to look for are colors. That was a depression era gambit to try to keep people buying. So there's a green one and there's a brown one. And then this one is Canadian Kodak. They did make their own stuff up there. And the Canadian label makes it a little scarcer. This would have been done right around 1900. And we've got the folding pocket Kodak here from about 1902. When you see these brass frames on the lenses, these are older. And there's one in red. This little Falcon. Falcon was a low-end brand, but they made some neat looking stuff and the boxes were cute, so people collect those just for the graphics and the look. Sawyer's Nomad. Well, oh, that's a camera for me, isn't it? This is the company that made Viewmasters, and you'll notice some similarities in terms of the buttons and the plastic and some of the things they did. Those were made in Portland, Oregon. Now a super fun site because the Bakelite has formaldehyde in it, and the formaldehyde toxified the site. It was probably not great to work around either. There are reasons we do things differently nowadays. And this one is a folding brownie. This is the big box format. Notice how it diaphragm comes out to the side instead of vertically, it's horizontal. This one is $180, it's the 3A, so it's pretty early. That's gonna be right around the turn of the 20th century. Well, I've gotta show you my newest acquisition. This was outside. It was marked 30, I got it for 25. It is Blanco. It does not have its paper label, but I had this piece once before. There's the Pontel, a little more polished than they usually are for Blanco. This is from the early 70s, and I had one of these, which my friend Deb in Portland, Oregon, fell in love with at a show, and I made her a nice price, and I haven't had one since, and that's been a couple of years, so glad to have one back. These don't come up very often. Now this is the space where I bought the Blanco vase, and he does have some other cool stuff that I'll show you. This ovoid shaped jug with the number three is a salt lace stoneware. Obviously there was intended to be some sort of a cartouche or medallion or makers or customer who was buying it for their store, but they didn't get that on there, so we don't know where it came from. Roseville and Weller love to steal each other's designs. This appears to be Roseville's Donatello pattern. Weller did a very similar design around the same time in the 1910s. I like this Britain's Pride guy here. That's pretty cool. He is part of a doorstop. And the sailor figure is great. That's got to be from about 1920. There was a lot of interest in the Navy in England at that time because King George V had been in the Royal Navy. So he was known as the Sailor King. This guy's just sort of everything. He's an owl and mushrooms and hand form metal and a burl base. All of those are very popular motifs right now. So I'm sure he's out of my league, but I think he's great. These are Japanese story jars. You can see the story written in the faces of the many people on the outside. Satsuma is an area in Japan that makes this wear. These are painted even on the bottom, so you don't see the tan clay that you usually see. This is more of a porcelain, and it's a story mug because inside, there is the story. Not in a language I can read, but I'm sure that it's very interesting. And they're pretty cool. They're priced at 125 and 150. And for a story jar, well, that's an unusual thing to find. So that's why the price. Latticino shoe made in Italy. That's a pretty piece. I think he only wanted 20 or 25 for that, which I thought was very fair. He's got some nice paperweights as well. So this is part of what we like about the February show is that we get dealers who aren't here most of the rest of the year and we get to see some different things. Look at this old water cooler. It's in a Jasperware like finish, but it does not look as well formed as Wedgwood. My guess is that that would be by the Adams Company. 
This is a consolidated glass vase from the 1930s. Consolidated glass was really pretty stuff made in Pennsylvania. Some of the molds went to Phoenix, later to Pilgrim and Sinclair and other companies. Here's a Blanco lamp. You don't see a lot of lamps from Blanco, and here's something very important. This is what a Blanco harp looks like. They're always adjustable. If it doesn't have this harp, it does not have the original harp because all their lamps have that feature. The square label tells us this is 1980s, but that feature with the harp was prevalent even back in the 1950s and 60s with their lamps. And then here's a Mahjong set where the tiles are plastic, but the trays are still Bakelite, and it's priced at $100. If the chips were also Bakelite, it'd be priced double that. Well, it's the Buccaneers who are in the Super Bowl this weekend, but here is a Miami Dolphins hat with a whole lot of signatures. Hat, of course it's a helmet. That's pretty neat. Makes me wish I'd saved my Bucks helmet now. I bet it would sell for a lot more. Well, size does make a difference, and this one is a foot taller than the one that I sold right away for over 100, and it's priced at 200. Bittersweet by Ellie Smith in the hobnail with the pole. You can see just a little bit of that yellow at the bottom and then up into the orange. This has to be, gosh, three and a half feet tall at least. Sort of the holy grail of swung bases. Well, the fellow behind me here has an interesting booth full of old tools and he sharpens them and he cleans them and he makes them very presentable and he's got everything from woodworking planes to old Yankee screwdrivers. I need to go get open, so I'll give you a quick scan of his very cool booth. And I'll show these fellas as they're opening. There's another one here I hope I can come back to because I understand he's doing a lot of wholesaling and that that's a good one to shop at. But in the meantime, I've got to go get my booth open. So this is George the Antique Nomad, and I'm signing off for now from the West Palm Beach Antique Extravaganza. But it's great to see you again. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and here on YouTube. So we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!